Well, welcome to this part two. Um, soon we should be into the workshop getting down and dirty trying to make some black dots. You can run the same test to see whether you can make black dots on your machine. But before we do that, there are one or two more important things I want to just cover with Lightburn. Now, as I said before, Lightburn is a fantastic piece of software. And if you understand what it's doing, it can tell you a lot of information. Now, I've imported this image, which you saw last time, and this is 127 ppi, pixels per inch. So let's go and have a look at this in this lovely tool that Lightburn's provided. We put handles on the picture and then we do right click and we can come down here to adjust image. And here we've got both my images side by side. Now they look exactly the same. And that's because if we take a look down at the bottom left hand corner here, we see they're both grayscale. OK, so if I zoom in on this one, if we take a look at this one, look at all the pixels down here. You can see the pixel size. What about here? Maybe just, but up here you can begin to see the pixel size. It's very, very small. Why is that? So when we zoom in, we can see that this image is pretty coarse because this is 127 PPI. And if we take a look at this image over here, in some ways it looks a bit blurry, but in fact, that's because this one has been resampled and the image that you see on the screen there is now 254 PPI. Take a look at this picture at the bottom here. Deep, it says DPI because that's what this signal will be output as, 254 PPI, hoping that you're going to be able to match the pixel size and produce DPI. But at the moment, this image is PPI, pixels per inch. And there's a lot more pixels in this image than in that image. How do we know that? Look down at the bottom here. We've got 1500 by 1678 pixels. And here we've only got 750 by 839. So be careful, because although you've resampled this picture up, you've got to make sure that you can reproduce the pixels that are in that image. So if I turn that to a dithered image, those pixels on there have got to be replicated by dots that you are going to burn. Let's just keep it simple and say 0.1 pixels, 0.1 dots, and you'll be on the safe side. Now, you haven't got to produce 0.1 white dots because white dots are the background. You can only produce black dots with the burning effect of your laser. So we don't appear to get any change of quality as I reduce that image down. It still looks almost as good as it did when it was big. It's a smaller picture of the big one. OK, so let's go and have a look and see what that now looks like with our 127 pixels per inch output. We've got a picture on the left there, which is 127 PPI. And down at the bottom here, look, we've got 127 DPI output. Let's zoom in on the eye and see what happens. Yeah, although the original image looks pretty damn good, the revised image, because we've shrunk it down, we've kept the pixel size the same. And remember what I showed you before, you cannot use big pixels on a small image because you don't get as many pixels to define the quality of every detail. Now we've only got a few pixels defining that eye, whereas on the left hand side at 127 pixels per inch, we had hundreds of pixels defining the eye. So be careful, shrinking your picture in Lightburn will degrade its quality very quickly. Let's take a look at that as a dithered image, Jarvis. Hmm. Not going to look very pretty, is it? Enough of threatening you with pixels. Let's go and see how we recreate those pixels in the real world. Now, before we do that, you need to understand how can we even think about burning a pixel? Point one dot. How do we get a point one dot? Well, the first thing we need to understand is a little bit about lenses. Regardless of whether or not you've got a CO2 machine or a diode laser, the only way that you can make a burn or a damage to your material is if you focus the intensity of light onto the surface of your material. That red picture on the right there 
is the image that everybody has about how a lens works. And in essence, it's true. Remember, light only ever travels in straight lines unless it's refracted. So a free light beam coming out of the lens will travel in this direction and it will remain traveling in this direction down here. And it will cross over at a point, a certain distance away from the lens, which is called the focal point, which is a point of nothingness, which is actually physically impossible. Physics says you cannot have a focal point any smaller than the light wave length you're passing through it. The diode laser, that could be 450 nanometers minimum. And for the CO2 laser, that'll be 10 or 11 microns. This area around here is called an area of uncertainty. There's all sorts of funny things going on here, and I'm not gonna talk about that at the moment, but that will become a little bit obvious as to what that uncertain area is when I move on a little bit. So remember that the smallest possible dimension you could have at that spot, at the crossover point there, is one wavelength of light. So for a CO2 laser, which these lenses are designed for, then that can be no smaller than 10.6 microns. I'm going to be using a 1.5 inch focal length lens, which I'm pointing to at the top of the picture. This data chart tells me that if I move away from A, the theoretical focal point, by a distance, plus or minus, here it is, plus or minus, 0.2, I should be able to achieve 600 dpi, i.e. a spot size of 0 0.042, four times the wavelength of the light, roughly. When we go down into the workshop, we're going to see if we can achieve this 0 0.042 magic spot size. Because if we can, look, we should be able to produce images at 600 dpi. Now, if you believe that, you'll believe in Santa Claus because it doesn't exist. And I'm going to show you that categorically. So you can forget whatever your lens manufacturer tells you or your machine manufacturer if you've got a diode laser. You can test it for yourself with the same techniques that I'm going to test and find out what your real dot size is, your real spot size is. I will just remind you that the focal point is the point through which all the light rays pass. Now, this dimension A, which is the plus or minus, is supposedly the depth of field. But I, again, I will guarantee that those numbers are meaningless because... This information here is created using standard lens theory. And standard lens theory has boundaries. What are those boundaries? Well, number one, we must tell the formula what size the beam is. And there it is at the top there. Look, we've got a clear definition of the beam size. Now, my laser claims to have a five millimeter beam. I know it doesn't have because it's at least 10 millimeters diameter. I can prove that as well. Now, you don't have that luxury with a, with a diode laser because you can't get behind your lenses. You just have to take what comes out of the lens and believe what the manufacturer tells you. The second condition for the formula to work is that we've got parallel rays of light coming into this lens. If you put converging rays in, it will shorten the focal length. If you put diverging rays in, it will increase the focal length. The final thing is it must be uniform light so if you hold a lens up to the sun, it will be focusing down parallel uniform light. That's not what we've got in our laser machine. We have a very, very special form of light, which is non-uniform. And we'll talk about that later on. If a focal point is what it says, we shall be able to focus the light into one spot, one size, and it doesn't change. A lens has got a characteristic focal distance and a characteristic focal spot. Is that true? We're now going to see how we go about trying to find the smallest dots. Now, this is not a simple process, and I'm not going to drag you through the whole lot, but I need to show you certain things in a certain order. Now, remember me telling you not a few seconds ago how important the focal point was. But what is the focal point? Well, as I tried to explain to you, it's that point supposedly through which all the rays of light pass. Okay, so before we can even attempt to get this spot size, which is supposedly the diameter of the beam at the focal point, we must find the focal point. And in that way, we should find the smaller spot size. Problem, how do we find the focal point? Well, there are two ways of finding the focal point. One is the way that I used to use, 
which is something called the ramp test. Now we'll do that in a second, but here I've got a one and a half inch lens which I'm going to put into this very short nozzle. Now what's going to happen is the lens finishes up roughly 10.6 millimeters inside the nozzle and we've got a 38.1 focal length so if, if I subtract what's inside the nozzle away from the focal length as in here we should finish up with an air gap here of 27.5 well hey I'm not going to get too worried about the odd half a millimeter we're going to stick with 28 millimeters as being our nominal focal point now I would normally use a little step gauge like this for setting my focus up but of course this gauge only goes up to 20 millimeters and don't laugh but I was very very lazy and I decided that I would just cut an alternative one out the same gauge but twice the size so it's now a 40 millimeter gauge with all the same writing on it so I've got to be careful I don't make a mistake I want to set 28 millimeter gap so it means I've got to set a 14 millimeter step which is 28 millimeters now I've measured that and that's correct within about 0.1 or 0.2 so again we're not going to get too worried amongst friends now there are two ways that I can put this lens in here there's the correct way which is the way in which the lens is designed and there's the wrong way which most people will tell me is the wrong way there's no such thing as a right and a wrong way for a lens there's a way in which the lens is designed and a way in which it works better for you or me so we've got to be undecided about what we're going to do here but we'll start off by putting in the right way so we'll just drop that lens tube in there and here's my little ramp test gauge now this dimension here is the nominal focal distance so when I put that on there there's a slope on there as you can see if I set this to the correct focal distance here which is remember 28 millimeter air gap so if I set myself a 28 millimeter air gap and 28 millimeters should be 14 on this gauge the focal point should be there according to the manufacturer right in the center the problem is that this machine has got a what I call a b-grade tube in it it's got a very very large beam this is not a correct specification tube but I've specifically put this tube on this machine for experimental purposes that's why I'm comparing these two machines and I'm going to set the power to 50% and I'm going to set the speed to 300 and we're going to hold the pulse button and the arrow button and drive it up, up the ramp we're going to take the lens out we're going to turn the lens over now we set the focus to a 28 millimeter gap again and we're ready to do another test with the lens this time the wrong way round. We'll take this over to the other machine now which has got the correct size diameter beam on it and we'll carry out the same test again. So remember we've got the lens up the wrong way at the moment so I'm going to try and draw a line down this edge 300 millimeters a second 50% power exactly the same as the other machine now we'll turn the lens over. We now run the test with the lens the right way round. We can see the line getting thick here. And it gets thinner and thinner, the thinnest point. It starts to get a bit thicker here, but it's still pretty thin all the way through here. Maybe it starts to get thicker there. So I don't know whether that could be classed as a focal point whether that could be classed as a focal point or whether that could be classed as a focal point these steps here are one millimeter difference so there's at least a one millimeter guessing zone here maybe two millimeter guessing zone here where we think the focal point is with the lens the right way around on the other machine even though we can't find the focal point maybe the focal point is at the center of these marks and if it's at the center of these marks then it's either there there, there, or there. In other words, the focal point is all over the place for the same lens, different ways up on different machines. With the ramp test, we'd be guessing where the focal point I mean, is. There is another way that we could look at that. We could look at it with a piece of acrylic. Now, I've not changed anything. All the focal points are exactly the same. So this is number test number four. 
This time we're doing it on acrylic. Now if we catch that at just the right angle you'll see that we can see where the deepest cut is because there's a zone there which tells us where the deepest cut is and the deepest cut is probably somewhere around about here maybe a millimetre and a half maybe a millimetre and a quarter above the focal point so with a black background even there it's difficult to see exactly where the focal point is but it definitely looks as though it's somewhere here so that means the focal point is less than 38.1 it's at least 37.1 maybe even 36 point something so I no longer use the ramp test I've written a little test a line test here which I think has been copied quite a few times elsewhere because this is a much more accurate way of determining focal height that I've been using for several years now. Well, what I'm planning to do is to drop this down eight millimetres, one millimetre at a time, the table drops. Watch the table go down one millimetre at a time. So 24 is our starting gap. And what we've got to do is to determine which of those lines is the thinnest line. Well, I would say that it is that one there, okay? So that's 24, 26, 27. So let's swap the lens over and run the same test again. Now I like MDF because it shows up a really nice contrasty set of lines. And that's why it's so much easier to pick out the focal distance with the line test. The problem is when you're producing dots, you're not really producing lines you'll keep switching the machine on and off and on and off. So what I've got is another test here. So we're still using this lens the wrong way round, but the best focus was at 29. So let's set this to 29. A bit difficult with a gauge that only steps in two millimetres. So I'm going to have to resort to my previous method of putting a 10 mil spacer underneath and setting this to 19. We've just established where the focal point is, 29 millimetres. And I've set this beam up to 29 millimetres for the focal point. But what I've then done, I've set the duration of the beam, the exposure time for each one of these differently. Two milliseconds, five, 10, 20, 50, 100 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds, which is half a second, then one, two, and three seconds. Now, look, if all the rays are passing through one point, why does the beam get bigger with time? It makes no sense at all. If all the light beams are passing through one point, every one of these dots should be that size. Now I'm leaving you to think for a minute. If you're running at a certain DPI, you're not running continuously like these lines here. You're running in on off, on off mode. But what is your on off period? If you look at a single dot, a row of single dots as I demonstrated in the bottom row of my pattern, then somewhere along the way, depending on the speed that you run, you are going to have a change of exposure time. And look what happens as you change the exposure time. You change the size of your dots. Now I've run this test at 50% power. This time I'm gonna run this machine at around about 12% power. Okay, now I'm produced these dots with the lens this way round. We'll repeat this last pattern here with the lens the other way round and I'll set it to 27, the optimal focal point. We go and look at those under the microscope because there's no way, unless you've got a very good, strong eyeglass or superpowers, you won't be able to see what's going on. That's what a two millisecond dot looks like. 
at 50% power. But you notice there's something strange about it. It's got a conical edge to it. It seems to have a black centre, but the black centre, as I said, is a false impression. It's a hole. It's a black hole. But round the edge of the black hole, there is a scorch zone because there's so much power there that it's actually not scorched it. Scorching doesn't occur until we get to there. And now we've got a black hole with a very slightly scorched edge around it. And as we carry on, the hole gets bigger and the scorching gets a bit bigger as well. And there we start coming into 20, 10, which is there somewhere. Oh, yes, it is there. But if you look, you'll see that there's a black hole in the centre. But a lot of scorching round the outside. So I'm going to ignore some of the un more unreasonable dots because we're not going to be using dots that are anywhere near this long. Now, I'm just going to look at this 10 millisecond dot with the lens the right way round and compare that to a 10 millisecond dot with the lens the wrong way round. So that's the right way round. That dot looks quite small. Now, we've got a scale on the screen there, which is millimetres, three, four, five millimetres. So let's assess the size of that hole that we've burnt, should we? So there's 10 divisions there. So that hole is about 0.2 diameter, not 0.05, and this is with a 10 millisecond burn. So if I change the exposure time, I increase the dot size. Well, what good is that? I thought we were going to have a constant dot size because that's what the manufacturer of the lens promised us. As I said to you before, these lenses are not what you think they are. They don't perform how you imagine. These lenses would work wonderfully well in a microscope, a telescope, a projector, a camera, because they're projecting images. We are not projecting images. We're projecting light intensity. We're trying to focus light intensity. We're not worried whether it's scrambled up or not. So that's the first thing I need to make you understand. You're not going to get what you expect. So you must test it for yourself. So. If I'm going to finish up with a 0.2 dot, that means I'm stuck with 127 PPI images. The peculiar behaviour that we've seen so far of lenses is all to do with this problem here. Now at the top left you see a section through a beam of light that's normal light and the sort of thing that you see at the theatre, a spotlight. It's got nice clean edges to it. It's a clearly defined beam size and it's uniform in its intensity. Now, the other picture is what you'd see if you could take a section through our invisible laser beam. It's very, very bright in the center. The intensity is high right at the center of the beam, and the intensity starts dropping off. The brightness starts dropping off as we move away from the center. And as you can see, there is no clearly defined beam diameter. It just fades away to nothing. Now, if we draw a graph of the intensity profile across our laser beam, here's what we see. It's a mathematical graph called a Gaussian distribution. There are three properties about the shape. Number one is the beam diameter across the bottom. Number two is the shape or the height of that graph. As the color changes, so the intensity drops down. Now, I've used red for the most intense, the most damaging part of the beam. Now, I say the most damaging part of the beam because we damage material with light intensity. We don't damage it with light. We've got a special sort of light, which I'm not going to explain, but it's the intensity of that light that damages material. The more intensity, the faster the material will get damaged. Even those low intensity rays at the outside, they are still going to have damaging effect. So we get quick damage with the center of the beam and slow damage with the outer edges of the beam. So that's the second property, intensity. The third property is the area underneath the graph. Now the area underneath the graph is watts. 
So let's just assume that graph A is 60 watts. And we move across to graph B and you'll see that I've ghosted in graph A is a green line. And then what I've done, I've changed the beam power, the area under the graph, to 180 watts. So the graph shape remains mathematically the same proportions. But what's happened is the center of the beam has pushed up to a much, much higher intensity. So if you take a look at the number 82, you'll see that 3 times 82 is 246, right? And the 13 has gone up to 39. The ratios in the graph have remained the same. So let's now go back from A and let's do something different. What we're going to do, we're going to keep the power the same, 82, 60 watts. And we're going to squash the beam diameter from 6 millimeters diameter down to 2 millimeters diameter. We've still got 60 watts in that beam as opposed to the one in the middle, which has got 180 watts in it. They're still achieving the same damage capability, the intensity, still 246 on both of them. As you can see from the red lines, they're very much closer together on the right than they are on the other two images. As I mentioned to you before, the diameter of the beam can have an effect on what happens to your dot size. Now I'm showing you this slightly different view of a Gaussian intensity distribution. The diode laser and the RF laser have got different properties to the glass tube laser when it comes to this energy distribution. With a glass tube machine, when you change the percent power, you're actually changing the shape of the beam. So where it points to Gaussian intensity distribution, that first left-hand shape, you recognize it. As we push the power up, the beam diameter does not change but the shape of the beam gets sharper and sharper and sharper. I use the word sharper to indicate that the center of the beam is getting more power than the edge of the beam. Both the RF and the diode laser only ever put out a sharp beam. They don't have any of this softening of the beam as the power drops off. They use a completely different control system called pulse width modulation. They use exposure time as their means of controlling the power. So if you only have a short exposure time, you don't do much damage. I'm afraid the quality of the beam, the sharpness of the beam, is nowhere near this shape with a diode laser. It's more like the shape shown in this top graph here. Now the CO2 laser uses special material for its lenses. And this special material means that we've only got a limited shape set of lenses that we can work with. One of the shapes is this thing, what you see here, called a plano convex lens. It's convex on one side and a mirror's plane surface on the other. Light comes in from the left-hand side onto the curved surface, and that is the right way, supposedly, to use a lens, because that's the way the lens has been designed. Unfortunately, with spherical geometry, which is the most simple geometry to produce for a lens, we inherit a problem. And that problem is something called spherical aberration. Spherical aberration happens when the rays from the outside diameter of a lens focus at a different point to those that are passing down the central axis of the lens. And if you draw a profile around the outside of those beams, you'll see that we get this waist-like necking, this zone of uncertainty that we spoke about earlier. Well, this is what I call fuzzy focus. And it partly explains why we don't get a single focus and our dot changes size. We haven't got what the manufacturer promised us. Here's what happens to the light rays when we flip the lens over. Look at the way in which all the rays are bouncing off in different directions. Look at the variation in the focus of the outer rays to those that are coming down the center. This diagram makes it look terrible. And it is terrible as far as the outer rays are concerned. But the one thing that this picture doesn't show you is where my red rays that I spoke about earlier, the high intensity rays that pass through the center of the lens, it doesn't show you what's happening to those. So just to show you the performance of these two different lenses, here we've got my 38.1 plano convex lens. And this time I've passed it through a piece of very thin paper. 
And that shows up much more clearly the low intensity scorching part of the beam that's taking place around the high intensity central part of the beam. Make a note of how we've got a much larger beam here when we use the flat side down than when we use the flat side up the wrong way. With the wrong way, we are getting a smaller high intensity central burn. But if we take a look at the two millisecond burn, which is the sort of area that we're going to be trying to produce dots in, we find that we get a bigger central burn and a smaller halo. And here, when we use it flat side down, we get a smaller central burn, but a bigger scorch halo around the dot. Do we see the hole or do we see the scorch mark? That's the interesting question. Now, just very finally to reinforce this point about what's happening with a lens, as we pass this Gaussian distribution intensity through a lens. But look what happens as we start focusing down towards the focal point. We don't have a Gaussian distribution anymore. The red rays, they're coming out the other side of the focal point pretty much the same as they went in. It's these outer rays which are being, if you like, shot out in all different directions. They're not going to do much damage out here. The bit that's really going to do the damage is these are these red rays. And then we've got the low intensity scorching around the outside of the central part of the beam. Right, back in the workshop. I'm going to run the focus test one more time because I want to show you something very important. Now, I'm running this test with 20% power. Now, I don't know whether this lens is the right way up or the wrong way up, but it doesn't really matter because what we found is the intensity focus. And looking at this, we could probably say that one of those two lines is the focus. And on balance, can we make a decision? Difficult to say. When we look at on the edge, I don't think there's any doubt as to where the focus actually is. So the nominal focus should be that one. And sure enough, as you can see, it's the deepest cut. But the point that I'm making here is, setting the focus means you will be making these red rays, which are the ones that are causing the maximum amount of damage. They're not going to produce a spot. They're going to produce a cone, a deep cone, a burn. Now we look at those from a distance and we think that these are probably thin black lines. Well, we know that they're not thin black lines because you've just seen, it's a deep V. So we'll just do a quick modification to this piece of wood. So there's our test with all its black lines on it. Now, the deepest one is the one in the middle. So I suspect I might be able to break that. Yes, I can. And we can take a look at what's inside that cut. Is it black? No, it's a very pale brown. We're getting a false impression of what blackness is. We didn't produce black lines. What we did, we vaporized the wood that's down inside that V. The energy was so high that it actually hasn't burnt the wood. We haven't scorched it, we've vaporized it. And all we've done, we've left this very slight brown mark on the surface. That's not char, it's not charcoal. So, black lines are not quite what they seem. And the same may be applying to black dots. Oh, by the way, just as an aside, if you want to stop your lens from cutting, and vaporizing, as we're doing there, and we're only using 20% power, remember, very low power, there is a way that we can do it, and that is to remove the cutting ability of those central red rays. How do I do that? Well, there we go. There's a lens that doesn't cut. I don't expect you to do that to your lens. So we're going to use MDF because as I mentioned before, this is a nice material that has got a nice black 
it, it, it produces a black mark because it's got the plastic binder in it. We'll have our first attempt at my dot test. Now this is a test that I use for setting up the focus and for trying to get 0.1 dots. And there we go. Now there's no way you can see that test, but what we need to do is go and have a look at that under my uh, USB microscope that I've got here in the workshop. Well that produces a nice black mark. And for a first attempt, these are pretty good. Look, these are less than 0.1 dots because the dot is small and the gap is big. Wow, that's amazing with a one and a half inch lens. And I'm not sure, well, we're pretty, we're pretty accurate with focus as well. We've got quite thin lines along the top here. So what we'll do, we'll change this material away from something which has got all this confusing background on it. You can see this MDF is wood chips with a binder but the wood chips are getting in the way of us looking at the pattern. So what we do, we'll go back to our nice um, poplar plywood. So small you can hardly see it, look down here. That's actually not bad either. It's not good, but it's not bad because A, we've got some quite nice thin lines along the bottom here. We're, we're pretty well in focus, which is what these are trope designed to do. We could adjust the focus to make these as thin as we possibly can. But because remember, making these as thin as possible is actually making them as deep as possible. And then we've got these here. So look, some of these are black, which means that we've got some depth in there. I mean, they're not bad. We've got nearly 0.1 dots there. They're almost like 0.1 sausages because you can see we've got a dash, then we've got a gap that's more or less the same size this probably would give a reasonable a reasonable photographic replication not perfect but reasonable so we need to see if we can find a way to make this a bit better and the way to make it better is to make the focal distance shorter so this is a one and a half inch lens 38.1 I'm going to change the lens system now to something completely different. Now if you've got a diode laser you don't have the luxury of being able to do what I'm able to do here. Now I spent absolutely ages experimenting with all sorts of shapes, sizes, spacings of lenses about four or five years ago to develop this particular system and you can buy this system on Cloudray. It's called a Universal Engraving Compound Lens Kit. And here we've got a two and a half inch CVD, 63.5 CVD lens, which is an American lens, bright yellow. Okay, and it's a meniscus lens, which means it's got a hollow bottom and a raised top. And we put that in first with the, let's call it the flat side down. And then on top of that, we've got our standard one and a half inch lens that we have been using. Okay, and we'll pop that on top of that. You've got two different lenses in there, one of them 63.5, and I'm gonna reduce the focal length of that bottom lens from 63.5 down to about 21, by virtue of putting the other lens on top of it. So 21 minus roughly the 10 depth that's inside there, remember, means I'm gonna finish up with about somewhere in the region of 10.5 to 11 millimeters of air gap. Now, because this is a very short focal length, it's very, very sensitive to small changes in focus. This focus gauge is one with a slight difference. So I'll just set that to the middle of the gauge, which is 11 millimeters, just as a starting point. Okay, so we run this same test now on a nice piece of fairly bland poplar plywood that hasn't got much grain in it and not much, not much disturbance to the surface. Here we can see a problem. We've got some very thin dark lines in the centre there, look, which is the high power central part of the beam. And here we've got a little bit of depression, but most of the time, look, we've got this superficial round the edge of the beam halo, the brown halo. Hmm. So, but the first thing we've got to do is to get this sharply in focus across here. So we do that literally by playing with the focus. Now to do this, 
there's no way you're going to be able to set this up with the normal naked eye. You're either going to need something like this, which is just an ordinary magnifying glass. I think this is probably about 10 or 12 times magnification. Or you're going to have to go for something like this, which is a, a proper measuring loop. You can probably see in the bottom there, look, it's got a scale. These are more expensive and you don't really need this much because we know what size the dots are. The pixels are 0.1. So we don't actually need a measuring system. This is the way to quickly find out whether or not you've got your focus set right. So I need to find out whether I've got to go up or down. Now I've got the idea I've probably got to go up a little bit. So I need to push my focus up to maybe, let's go up to 11.5. That's a lot, half a millimeter for this lens. So we find out whether we're going the right way or not. And a quick look tells me, yes, we are going the right way. We've got the top line of dashes thinner now, but perhaps I've gone too far. No, I think we've got to go more, not less. So we just let that ride on the gauge and we push the gauge underneath until it gets to 11.7 and then we tighten it up. So there's nothing complicated about setting the focus. We've got our nice thin black lines along the top here. We've got just a hint, just a hint here of some sort of, um, let's call it, halo. And we can see down here we've got some nice dots. 0 0.1, 0 0.1 gap. 0 0.1, 0 0.1 gap. So we've got quite a nice line along there. Now I suspect that these are changing because we've got a different height. The material wood grain has an effect. Right? But the other thing to note here, although we've got these black high intensity centers to the dots, we've got a very slight brown halo around the dots. Now, that's going to have an effect on the picture that you produce because your eye is going to see this brown hue in the background, not this white colour. Let's put a piece of cardboard under there, shall we? And we'll see what happens with a piece of cardboard. Now, we determined that for this poplar plywood, we needed a focus of 11.7. So let's set that back to 11.7. We'll run the test on this material with exactly the same power, 20% power settings. So look at that, it's absolutely amazing. Not a hint of any browning on that because it's a different material. Now, remember, there are lots of stray rays that are around the central red core of this beam. What you're seeing there is the red core doing its job. And all those stray rays, they're not strong enough to cause any sort of haloing or burning. I'm gonna try exactly the same thing on something else. Now, I've not changed the settings at all. What do we notice? Well, first of all, the lines are a lot thicker. What is this material? Well, this is black anodized aluminium. It's a fantastic material for engraving on, but it's got some weird properties. The black that you see there is really a water-based dye, which is just slightly embedded into the surface of the white material that's underneath, which is aluminium oxide. Now the aluminium oxide doesn't disappear until about 2000 degrees C. We're not putting enough exposure time in to burn through the aluminium oxide, which is the anodizing. What we are doing, we're putting enough energy into that surface to evaporate the water-based dye, which is on the surface or just below the surface. More exposure time gives bigger dots. But we're getting wider lines because the material, the water-based dye, evaporates, or we're vaporizing it, whichever way you want to say it, with a bigger part of the beam. We're not just using the high energy part of the beam. We're using some of this crap that's round the central core, and that's making the line wider. Now, how do we filter that out? Well, we can filter that out with more, power, more speed or less power, but I'm already only using 14% power on this laser tube. Now, that squarely puts this into something called the pre-ionization zone for this machine, which is the perfect zone to be working in for normal engraving. So the only choice that I've got now is to try and decrease that line width, either with focus, which is one possibility, or with speed. Let's try and change it with focus to start with. 
Well, after a little bit of fiddling, um, we managed to get that to 400 millimeters a second, 11.2 focus, and 13.5% power. So, yeah, it's tricky getting some of these materials into the right zone. Now with black acrylic, that's a probably about as good as I can get. So they look something like around about 0.15 dots. So I'm really limited to about 170 or 180 uh, PPI if I create an image in black acrylic. <clears throat> Here I've got something which is about a millimetre thick and it's an absorbent card that they use for beer mats. This is basically just wood pulp, nothing else in it. So this is, I suppose you can get as close as possible to grainless wood. So for this beer mat card, we've come out with 200 millimetres a second, 14% power and 11.4 focus. That looks nice. So there's my original 127 PPI image. Um, I'm now going to create a new picture at 254 PPI. And I'm going to make the size, we don't work in pixels, I'm an engineer, so I work in millimetres. And we're going to put this onto a piece of A4 paper. So I'm going to make the width about probably 180, and we'll make the height, say, 250. So that's the size I want to finish up with. Now that's produced an empty page at 254 ppi. I can drag that 127 picture into there, Hold down the shift key and drag that. Well, we can keep that aspect ratio. That's still 254 ppi. And I can now actually crop that. Okay, we'll just check up here and we'll see that what I've now done, image size, 254 ppi, 18 centimeters wide and 20 centimeters tall. We'll take our original 127 picture off and all we do with this one, so we go to image mode and at the moment it's a multicolored picture so we'll turn it to grayscale, merge, and now we'll turn it into a bitmap, image mode bitmap. Okay, flatten the layers, okay, and we'll produce a dithered diffusion, a diffusion dither. Now, I've done quite a bit of investigation, and it turns out that this diffusion dither in Photoshop is almost the same as Jarvis. OK, now, as I said before, that might look like rubbish, but that's only because that does not match the pixels on the screen. So if I change the size of the picture, there we go. This laptop screen is different to my main desktop screen, so I only had to make one jump to match the pixels. Save it as a bitmap, yes. It doesn't matter whether I put this into RD Works or into Lightburn because I'm not going to do anything to it. I'm just going to use the software as a printing processor. Now I need to set my parameters that I've just established. First of all, we're going to do this on pass through, so we're going to have no effect on anything. 200 millimeters a second, 14% power. Minimum, we're going to make that 14% power as well. Negative image, no. Bi directional scanning, yes. Now, the problem here is, have we got bi-directional scanning set up? Now, I'm not so sure I've got it set up in Lightburn. Ah, I have got it, look. 200 millimetres a second. I've, got, I've already got my um, scanning offset set in there. But it's essential that you do your scanning offset because you've got to have perfect registration between your backwards and forwards scan lines. Otherwise, all the pixels will get muddled up. We've got a very short focus lens, which I've accurately set to 11.4 millimeter focus. Now there's no point having an area which is 11.4 here and 10.6 here and here. It has to be 11.4 over the whole of that area. Now, my table is set up pretty well, but I never use my table for photo engraving. I always use this thing that I've made here, which is, does two things. First of all, if I've got slate or something solid, I can put it on here and I can level the slate up, and I'll show you how I do that. But if I've got paper, card, like this, then I put my card on there and look, it's up at the corners. All right? Well, that's no good because it's not going to engrave properly on the corners. So underneath here, we've got some fans. And this is effectively a very gentle vacuum table. Corners don't suck down very easily, but the middle sucks down very easily. And so what happens is you suck the 
corners down because you've sucked the middle down and now it's nice and flat. Whereas if I do it this way around, the middle sucks down but the corners are not necessarily pulled down. I've got one screw down here where my finger is and then I've got two screws down at the front here, one here and one here. You only need three pivot points and you can make the whole of this table flat. Okay, so I'll go to the back corner to start with and I'll set my focus up to 11.4. Okay, now I'll come down to the front left corner and I've got to set that up to 11.4 as well. Well, it's nowhere near at the moment. I can't even get the gauge under it. And we'll gently let that down until we can get 11.4. There we go, 11.4 on that corner, 0.4 on that corner. In this instance, my picture is nearly square. Quite often the pictures aren't square, they're portrait or they're landscape. In general, the most efficient way to print this picture is to rotate it through 90 degrees. Because there's less scan lines required this way. And every time you get to this end, you've got an over travel, which is wasted time. So you get a lot less wasted time if you make the height of the image the smallest one. OK, so I didn't have a choice. Lightburn has made a decision for me. It's going to print it from the bottom. Remember, what you're seeing here is probably not the black centre to the dots. You're seeing mainly the slightly brown halo that's round the outside of the dot. This is not a compromise. This is a copy of the photograph, a dithered image. We should see everything on here that we see on the dithered image. It should look like a grayscale image. You should see all the details, all the hairs, and there should be no 3D-ness when I rub my hand across the surface. Right? I've not modified this photograph at all, except dithered it. I've upscaled it, which is not a good thing normally. You try and finish, you try and start off with a high resolution image that if anything you downscale rather than upscale. Well we'll leave that cooking for about 20 minutes, half an hour and then it should be done. Now the places where you're going to find overlap and 3D-ness are on all the really heavy dark areas. So I think you'll agree that is a photo replication. That is not a photo engraving. I've shown you all the details that are essential for doing this quality of work. You can carry on doing photo engraving, modifying your pictures, and what you finish up is what I predicted. You'll finish up with a cartoon, uh, a pencil sketch, uh, charcoal sketch. It's not photo replication. I hope you can hear the rain beating down on my workshop here. It's, uh, it's been a sunny day but there's been lots of heavy showers today. Here we are in April and um, yeah that's what they say April showers we've got them. So I left photo engraving alone many years ago and in the meantime I've been practicing improving all the techniques that I need to do photo replication. This is photo replication which I think you will agree is a pretty good copy of the original. It's only because one basic rule, one pixel, one dot. It's as simple as that. The problem is, can you make your machine make dots? I've given you the tools and all the experience that I've got to show you how I go about doing it. It's now down to you. You're going to have difficulty with a diode laser because a diode laser doesn't have round dots. It has dots that are oval or they're even rectangular on a ratio maybe as much as 1 or 1.5 or 2 to 1. So you're really going to struggle with a diode laser to do photo replication. Yeah, you'll be able to get good quality stuff, but it might not be 
one dot equals one pixel, which is what I'm doing here. Well, I don't think there's any doubt that that is a pretty good replication of the original photograph. And that's come about because of one simple rule. One pixel equals one dot. Or put it the other way, one dot equals one pixel in your image. Pixels do not overlap, dots must not overlap. If you've got a machine that's incapable of doing 256 dpi, 0.1 pixels, then you'll have to back off the pixels in your image to match your machine. You can't make your machine magically produce high quality images. Something has to compromise. You either throw away the detail in the image so that it doesn't burn the image out, or you make the dots small enough so you can follow the rule of one dot equals one pixel. And that's how that picture was made. And I've shown you all the techniques that have gone into making that picture. Finally, if you want to try doing this for yourself with your machine, you will find this little pattern very, very helpful. And you can download this pattern at a link which I will leave in the description below this video. Thanks a lot for your time and I wish you good luck with your attempts.